Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're trying out a new, uh, as you can see, subtitle text at the bottom of your screen. I hope you can see it. Um, I hope it works well, but we're trying to think more about, especially with the launch of our Center for Diversity and Inclusion, thinking about that inclusion piece and those who may have uh, some visual or, uh, or hearing disabilities. So, I, I, my name is Tina McCorkendale. I'm the president and CEO of the Institute for Public Relations. We're a nonprofit research foundation, and we do research that matters to the profession. And today we're going to talk about uh, COVID-19 vaccinations and um, uh, the communicator's role within that. Uh, this is the, the guide that we put together. We put together really fast. So uh, there's a lot of updated current research in there, but it's really looking at theories, models, research driven uh, tips, pointers, thinking about how to increase vaccine communication um, or improve vaccine communication to increase vaccine uptake and, uh, and, and deal with issues with vaccine hesitancy. Um, and vaccine uptake is what we, what is typically what is used as increasing the number of people who actually get vaccines. Um, this is not a magic bullet to solve issues of vaccine hesitancy. If you came on here at, uh, looking for a magic bullet answer, uh, I can't give you one, but I can definitely tell you about theories and models and research to help guide your decision that people have already studied applying to other uh, vaccination situations. We had more than 30 contributors uh, work on the document, uh, and we have more than 100 research articles. Um, and not popular press articles, but real research articles to look at this phenomenon. Uh, this is going to be recorded. It will be sent for playback at the very end. All our research um, and webinars are available for free. You're more than welcome to share that out with whomever. Um, and then at the end of this guide, we also have a list of resources and articles as well as IPR ones uh, that you can take a look. This is a very meaty report. It's 44 pages um, and there's a lot of citations and others. So it's very hard to drill this down into an hour, but um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, I, people on my team are going to text them because I can't see the chat, unfortunately. Uh, and then I also have to thank our sponsors uh, who helped fund this, and that's Voya Financial, um, Orange Fiery, uh, and Dignity Health. So thanks to them, uh, all three of Paul Gennaro, uh, Mike Kazowski, and uh, um, Paul and um, Mark Klein are all on our board and great supporters. So thank you. All right, let's get going. All right, so uh, I already talked about what we did, so I guess I can skip this slide, uh, but this is what the report looks like. Um, and we're really proud of how fast we got this out. Uh, so, so we're excited about it. And you can download this from uh, our website at instituteforpr.org. All right, so this is based around 17 key findings that we found within the research. Um, and I'm gonna go through each one of these. Uh, at the beginning, you'll think like, oh my gosh, how are you gonna get this done in an hour? But some of the ones at the latter end speed up. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first is vaccine hesitancy. Uh, vaccine hesitancy is a significant topic in the literature that a lot of people talk about. Vaccine hesitancy is defined as the reluctance or refusal to vaccinate despite vaccine availability, that's key. There's a common perception that um, people uh, who are vaccine hesitant are because there's a lack of information. And you can see that in some cases with marketing campaigns or even in media trying to say, here's what you need to know about vaccines. But that's not the case. Vaccine hesitancy is not primarily due to a lack of information and it's not gonna be solved by just pushing more information out. Um, and studies have shown that, that you have to do other measures besides information alone to increase uptake. So I wanted to share with you a, uh, this is uh, vaccine hesitancy, it should not be confused with being anti-vaccination or anti-vaxxer because that's not the case. Um, this is a continuum of vaccine acceptance. So you can see where people fall on the scale. So you have at the far right, the accept all. These, this is me, this is me in line for my COVID vaccine. I accept all vaccinations, I'm very pro-vaccine. And then the other hand, you have the anti-vaccination movement. But in between are people who are more unsure. And there's a lot of that characteristics of why people may, they refuse, they're not sure, I may delay it. I may, you know, some of the things that we heard early on is that people wanted to see how others were affected. Um, and that's so that falls on a scale and you can't treat all vaccine hesitant people as the same, right? There's different levels. So you have to think about that. But regardless of where people fall on the scale, you have to treat those 
individuals with compassion, sensitivity, and respect. That is definitely important in the literature. You can't shame people. You can't call them out. It doesn't work. It actually can create what we call a backfire effect, which means that you strengthen their original position on an issue of being um, more vaccine hesitant. So you have to be really careful when dealing with people um, of like, why don't you trust science? So that is not the approach to take when communicating with people who are more vaccine hesitant. So looking at some of different models of vaccine hesitancy, this is the World Health Organization's, the three C's model of vaccine hesitancy, complacency, confidence, and convenience. Um, so this is uh, this was convened as part of a SAGE working group on vaccine hesitancy, but let's just briefly talk about each of those. So confidence is based on trust, the trust in the uh, safety, efficacy of the vaccines, in the health system and providers and the policy makers who are encouraging people to take vaccines. Um, complacency is the degree to which people believe in the risk of the perceived disease um, and whether a vaccine is needed to prevent it. There are, um, there are cases such as pertussis. There was a great study that was done about pertussis in West Virginia where parents didn't perceive the, uh, the um, impact of the disease to be as needed as just dealing with some of the um, the consequences of it if, if their child got pertussis. So they saw lower vaccination. So in this case, uh, you have differing degrees of whether COVID is actually is real um, and whether a vaccine can actually stop COVID. I think fortunately in the circumstance of COVID is that um, to the Moderna and uh, the Pfizer are like 90 to 95% efficacy with both, which is, is really high. So that should help uh, pull, pull the uh, complacency. And then convenience is not just about, is it convenient for me to do this vaccination? It's also availability, cost, is it accessible? Is, do I, is there information for me to understand it? Is information given in multilingual, uh, is it multilinguages? So health literacy and language also play a role. So if we move on, if you think about the personal determinants to vaccine hesitancy, it's not that, you know, this is Joe and this is what Joe thinks, or this is Samantha and this is what she thinks. There are so times today. This is not a one size fits all. You have to be very strategic and thoughtful about what you're doing and consider all about a multi-audience campaign that has to be um, that has to be very thoroughly done. So if you look at these influences under con contextual influences, this could be the media, religion, politics, and this is dependent on global, regional, local, all these areas. And you can see the whole list of things you have to consider with each audience. You also have individual and group influences. This is what is my family saying, what is my personal experience with vaccinations? How, what are, how do I think about health in general? And do I think that there are uh, benefits? What are my perceived risk of getting COVID? What is my, does the benefit outweigh the risk? And these are just very simplistic. And there's also some theories about why people um, and biases about why people may not get vaccinated that we'll talk about. Um, but there's also vaccine specific issues and around the vaccination itself. While in this study, or in this report, we do talk about multiple studies. Um, most of them don't really apply to COVID. There are, there are some that do. It was, this was a great year. I think it taught us a lot in getting research out and being able to do preprints and other ways to get it um, out there. But these areas, the mode of administration, no one is really focused as much on this to like two series dose that people are gonna have to take. That decreases the number of people who will go back for that second dose. And that's something to consider with behavioral science and other areas. But this is from the SAGE working groups uh, matrix that McDonald published that are currently working right now. So because of this, and you think of all these different areas of consideration, it's not a one size fits all. Tailoring communication is absolutely critical. Testing messages, pre-testing messages, saying we're in this together, helping others. There's language, language that you have to use. It protects themselves, but it also protects others. Um, and uh, the, uh, you also have to do research throughout to find out you know, what messages work and what messages don't work. And there's some great work in behavioral science and behavioral economics to the proper messaging and how to best test messages to see what's effective. I'll say why this is why we care as communicators. 
Like, why should this make, uh, but every organization, regardless if you're in healthcare or not, vaccine communication is critical because your employees are depending on you to be a trusted information source. With anything else that's happening externally, um, what we've seen throughout COVID is that employers are sources of information. And just like a lot of uh, corporate will have flu shots or other sort of vaccination clinics internally, we're not necessarily all in the office, but there are ways to increase uptake. Increasing uptake helps to get people back in the office, the economy, uh, society back to normal, which is why it's really important that um, communicators can make such a difference here and saving lives. I mean, this is the time to save lives. So along with the tailoring communication, agencies must be aligned. And this is the government, um, employers, healthcare communities, federal agencies, CDC, FDA, all must be aligned for a consistent message to increase public trust and confidence. I'll give you a great example. This morning, um, there is an article in the New York Times about someone who had an adverse reaction to uh, the uh, Pfizer vaccine. And it was a one-off. They had, uh, I think they had, um, they were having difficulty breathing and they had to treat, treat this individual. But, you know, these one-off stories and creating sort of, creating potential issues around you know, this one case without highlighting the others can create major issues. The other issue that we saw, and this doesn't, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you're on, um, misinformation, the government released misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it was downplaying the severity of the disease, whether you should wear a mask, the level of testing capacity, the types of uh, pharmacological interventions, um, in fact, PolitiFact this morning released their, they always do their top lie of the year, and their top lie was the coronavirus and all the misinformation surrounding the co uh, coronavirus. But what this does is this still, uh, efforts to diminish public trust and confidence, and then you have multiple people saying multiple things about the different, um, the vaccine, the virus, and it creates, uh, it creates uh, problems and trust. So it has to be some sort of alignment. With this, transparency is absolutely key. And what the research has found um, is that you cannot sugarcoat the risk of taking the vaccine. Um, in fact, research shows when you give people information about the potential adverse events, it makes them trust more. And it's also the responsible thing uh, to do. Um, but you also should be very transparent about the company's intention with the vaccines. Um, and encouraging employees in a way uh, to uh, take the vaccine. And there's multiple perspectives on this. Um, some um, corporations are, uh, or what I've heard is that, you know, asking people to take the vaccine. Others are saying it's really a more of a personal choice, um, but definitely don't uh, sugarcoat the risk. And one of the effects is, you know, it does hurt and there are some side effects and understanding how you can overcome those through um, behavioral science and psychological and uh, psychology can help with that. So here's, a, I want to give you an example of this. There's a couple of uh, information sheets that are given by the CDC. Um, and I'll just, from my perspective, the CDC does a terrible job with, with putting this out there. It's buried on their website. It's hard to find. And this is what, um, this is a vaccine information statement. Vaccine information statements um, should be given with each vaccination and it gives you information um, and access. And there has been studies that looked at the impact of the um, vaccine information statements. The vaccine information statements, when you give them to a um, potential patient before they get the vaccine does increase trust and confidence. But if you look at the vaccine information statements, I mean, they make PR people cringe because they look, they're just, they're just so stale and right. They're, they're like Q and A's um, and it's fine, but it just doesn't give you, it's not a very clean piece of information. It's like a one pager to give them. And, and that's, uh, that's their information sheet and they have it for all vaccinations and you can get them, but it's not very accessible. The other uh, area area that's been tested of giving out is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System or VAERS. And what that is, is that's a sheet. It's typically, it's more given to more established vaccines, but that tells you about adverse events. And there was a study, it was a really interesting study that we talked about in the paper that looked at what is the impact of giving someone just the VIS, the vaccine information sheet that you see on here. What is the impact of giving uh, the VIS and a brief summary of the VARS, which is the adverse event, and then also giving somebody a detailed report list of VARS and the VIS. 
And what they found is that the VIS does increase trust, but the true sweet spot is giving people both the vaccine information statements and giving people this summary of the VARs. When you give people the full detailed report, it overwhelms them with jargon information. It's not telling you anything that is hidden from you within the summary reports. So that turns people off. So it's finding that happy medium of giving people information and making it accessible. And this should be, of course, a healthcare expert. Um, you don't, you know, unless you're a healthcare company or something like that, you wanna be careful of who you're using to give information about the vaccine. Um, but the vaccine adverse event reporting system is managed by both the FDC, I'm sorry, FDA and the CDC, because um, currently the effects of this vaccine are um, specifically Pfizer, fa fatigue, headaches, and then myalgia, which is muscle pains from the vaccination. But having that understanding helps to build uh, credibility. So I wanted to show you what currently they're doing, the uh, CDC and FDA with the VARs. Uh, this is a vSafe. It's a downloadable app and it's a tracker that they use for reporting adverse events with the vaccination. It's a really, it's a really visual system from what I've seen. I haven't been vaccinated, of course. I'm, I think, one of the last people in line. Uh, but that helps people um, uh, if there is some situation that you can report it via a text program and it's very easy to use. And they encourage people to download this as soon as they get vaccinated so they have easy access to it and can also uh, structure how it's reported. All right, so let's talk about different groups with vaccinations. First, uh, marginalized groups have lower vaccine confidence and underrepresented groups. Uh, a just released study in early December by Pew Research, it just closed on, they stopped collecting data on November 29th, found that Black Americans are one of the least likely groups at 42%. And they say they probably or definitely will get a vaccine. So you're talking about the other 58% who are not sure or say they probably won't get the vaccination, which is a significant issue, especially as we've seen that um, minority groups, racial ethnic uh, minority groups have been disproportionately affected negatively by COVID vaccine in terms of both the numbers, but also what we've seen in terms of the treatment. Uh, Ernest Grant, he's the president of the American Nurses Association, and he did a interview with NPR and said, you know, uh, this is attributed to a long-standing history of abuse and racism against Black people and the need for more opinion leaders to visibly show support of the COVID-19 vaccination. And you know what, it's, it's interesting since this, um, since this, uh, uh, you know, um, a lot of people have talked about the Tuskegee syphilis study, and that's definitely the one that's held up, but that's not the only one. I mean, there's been studies uh, of um, uh, the, the military, prisons, castrations, and not to mention outside of medical, but just some of the injustice uh, um, through, the, um, through the healthcare system in general. And, and so that's the other thing of tailoring the information to these audiences. So the next is to make sure that the most trusted source are what we call the healthcare providers. And doctors and nurses, by far the most trusted source uh, for giving information about the vaccination. Um, and the doctors and nurses have to be given the tools and resources. They must understand the vaccination uh, they, and I know that sounds like, well, this is common sense, of course, but it's not. What the research shows is that you can have well-informed and not well-informed. I mean, you think about nurses or typically, especially with COVID, um, uh, they're under-resourced, they're working really long hours. So what is the best way to get information to them? Because other research has found with other vaccinations that um, a healthcare provider encouraging people to get vaccinated results in a 10 times more likely chance of getting vaccinated, especially if they say that this is a routine vaccination, an important vaccination, rather than the patient coming to the provider and saying, hey, what about this vaccine? That recommendation plays a role. Um, now, I should note that that's not always the case. So this is a very generalization of doctors and nurses, but it's not always the case. There are um, situations where there's other trusted sources as well. Um, and so that's why you have to make sure that the opinion leaders for each of the target audiences are defined. And this is sort of the concept of social contagion, that people have a tendency to think and act like their friends and family, and that encourages the adoption of behaviors. We run our annual disinformation study, and by far, uh, family and friends are the most trusted source. And that's the community as well that you're part of and how they can encourage um, adoption. And there's a great theory we talk about in the paper, we're not really gonna talk about here, but it's about diffusion of innovations, how mass media generates awareness knowledge, but it's really the interpersonal networks that affect uh, the adoption. 
All right, so I want to give you a great example. I'm sure you all know who this person is. Elvis Presley. Um, so this was this was a great example of, um, of a very effective campaign in uh, 1954 when Jonas Salk uh, developed the uh, uh, vaccine for polio. Um, there was a huge publicity campaign to promote vaccinations. Um, and at the time, one of the uh, big media gurus, Walter Winchell, said that the vaccine itself vaccination process. Um, Jonas Salk had to invite a correction. I mean, you know, PR has been going on. For and uh, when when people were vaccinated, they saw a Then Florham Park in New Jersey, and he recalls the same thing. They were in quarantine because of polio uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, what happened in 1956 on the Ed Sullivan show is that Elvis Presley, uh, that's Leona Baumgartner, who at the time was the New York City Commissioner of Health, um, and holding the arm of Elvis Presley, shot. And that shot uh, resulted in significant uptake among young adults and teens in getting vaccinated. So in 1963, the health commissioner said that the um, vaccination had reduced the number of new cases to zero. So in some cases, you can see a big impact. And journalist uh, and historian David Perry said specifically about COVID-19 that celebrity and leadership and activism can be overrated, but there are moments in which famous and trusted people can sway mass opinion in ways vital to the public good. So we can see that displayed here. All right. So we all hear about the anti-vaxxers and the anti-vaccination movement should not be ignored. Uh, this is really critical. In fact, anti-vaccination, or and they don't like to be called anti-vaxxers. There was a campaign a couple of years ago to change it to vaccine risk. Aware. But while you're not gonna most likely, you're not gonna really change the mind to the people on the far end of the spectrum, on either end of the spectrum. But um, what it does impact is, it does impact the people who are undecided about vaccination. So here's about the anti-vaxxers. We refer to this as the, um, the anti-vaccination movement. It's been around since the 1800s, as long as vaccines have been around. One of the cognitive biases associated with this is the Dunning-Kruger syndrome. You may have heard that. Um, and what it means is that, and it's not the case with all anti-vaxxers, but there has been research about it and that people who, um, who have low levels of knowledge think in cases that they know more than experts and also elevating non-experts to roles as well. And that's been a challenge of the anti-vaccination movement more when like Jenny McCarthy was elevated to a role as a non-expert expert on um, vaccines because her son had autism. Um, one of the other just fun tidbits is that a 2020 study estimated that 84% of Americans visit, um, this was pre-COVID by the way, visit a vaccine related webpage annually and about 19% actually encounter vaccine skeptical content, which is good. But the reason why anti-vaxxers shouldn't be ignored is because they are very influential on the undecided community, especially when they're going to look for information about vaccines. So I just wanted to give you a quick check-in about COVID and where we are. Um, 307,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the US. 17 million have had COVID-19 in the US. Uh, uh, yesterday, the, we had an all-time high around 3,600 people died of COVID yesterday. Um, and so I wanted to share with you a story about Ahmed Ayad. And Ahmed Ayad, um, Ahmed Ayad, you can see him here, he's 40 years old. He's in great shape, as you can tell. Uh, he weighs about 215 pounds. Um, he works in his family's retail furniture business. And then he also likes to compete in obstacle courses. Um, this is the Spartan race where you do all things like rope climbs and um, uh, they're not jungle gyms, but monkey bars. Uh, and you have to be in really great shape. He lives in DC. He uh, plays basketball several times a week. He has eight brothers and sisters. Um, he's the oldest son, uh, but he's the fourth uh, child. And Ahmed, Ahmed has shared his story about having COVID. He started experiencing flu-like symptoms in March pretty early on. Uh, he had a mild fever. Three days later, he was struggling to breathe and his friend took him to the hospital and they said he had both COVID-19 and uh, influenza. 
he's not sure where he caught COVID, but early on he went to Florida for three days to visit his brother. Um, Ahmad, he was admitted to Sibley Memorial later and they transferred him to Johns Hopkins Hospital and John Hopkins features him on their stories. This is a picture of him when he was in intensive care. He couldn't speak. He was on a ventilator for 25 days. He was heavily sedated, delirious. The nurses and doctors said he kept trying to pull out his tubes. He lost 60 pounds. So he weighed 215 pounds and he lost 60 pounds. And he slowly started recovering. And during this time, he couldn't have any family members visit him. Um, even when he went home from the hospital, um, his mom, he's Palestinian, so his mom had all this great Palestinian cooking, but she said she couldn't even like hug him or hold him for two weeks as he had to quarantine and help take care of himself. And he said on May 1st that every day he's getting better. He's slowly getting his weight back. He's eating a lot and he's taking walks. So here's a picture. Oh, and they said it was a miraculous recovery that he was able to walk again. This is him. He's a COVID-19 survivor. He said he had to learn to swallow again. It, he didn't eat solid food for over a month. He said he had to learn to talk again, walk again, and now he's almost back to normal. So what's the point of the story and why am I telling you about Ahmad? It's the next point I want to make. And that is that you have to tell stories and not statistics. I told you earlier how many people had died of COVID, but what is really successful around it is telling the stories of people, telling the stories of people who were impacted by the vaccine, how people have been affected by COVID. That is really the sweet spot. And it's one of the reasons why the anti-vaccination movement has been very successful because they're able to tell these very emotionally uh, connected stories that have an impact. So the next thing is to help encourage um, health literacy. So health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, understand basic health information to make, make appropriate health decisions. There's a few things we don't teach in companies. Um, media literacy is not something that our, um, our employees take, but that can be so valuable to them. Uh, health literacy, they're trained about, and that can be so valuable to them. So some of these courses can help out uh, tremendously. So according to the Health Resources and Services Administration, low health literacy is more prevalent among older adults, minority populations, those with low socioeconomic status, and medically underserved people. And the other interesting thing about health literacy is when people are searching for information online, that algorithms direct more health literate users to more reputable sources and then less um, health literate users to more fake cures or misleading medical advice. So that's something to consider also when thinking about it. But one of the main components of this paper is really thinking about theories and models and how those can guide behavior. Um, and we do explain these in more detail, but this is by Edgson. This is a theory of planned behavior. And I just wanna tell you, just show you some of the theories and how you can use them. Um, if you ignore, you can ignore these uh, because these really feed very much into these. Um, but what it does and what it talks about is the theory of planned behavior. And if you have these behavioral beliefs, your beliefs that you currently have will affect your attitude toward the behavior. And that attitude toward the behavior affects your intention and ultimately um, the actual behavior you engage in. And then you have what we have normative beliefs, which then lead to the subjective norm. And what that means, normative beliefs are basically around the motivation and what you perceive around people around you. So if the, your um, employer, your friends, your family, if they have sort of beliefs and influence that you should take a vaccine, then you're more likely to do it. You judge how positively what you do will be, be um, evaluated by others within your circle. And then you have control beliefs, and that's perceived behavioral control. And what that means is that there are certain elements that make it more likely for you to engage in certain behaviors, such as like competence, willpower, but also the laws themselves, right? If there is a law that you have to go get a vaccine, of course, that is going to affect your behavior. 
Um, but one of the uh, one of the areas of this model that's really important that's not reflected on here is anticipated regret. Anticipated regret, what they found in past studies about vaccines in general, is that that is one of the primary motivators for vaccine confidence with this theory. What anticipated regret is that the regret that you think you will feel before the behavior occurs. So if I think that I will regret not getting the vaccination, then I'm more likely to get the vaccination. So that's one example there. Um, and then I thought this was really interesting. This is sort of how you can take multiple theories and models and put them together. This is the TPB that I just showed you, the theory of plain behavior, and it's coupled with the self-determination theory. The self-determination theory concerns people's inherent growth tendencies and needs. So you can see how this plays a role, that the psychological needs support um, of what people have and how that affects the autonomous and controlled motivation. And then that affects what we talked about in the theory of planned behavior, the attitude people have, the subjective norms, right? The people surrounding you and your network and the behavioral control, right? That you have both around the vaccination, but also about what the impact you can make. Now, one thing to note here that's really important is that intention doesn't lead to behavior. You saw this. I, I did polling, I did call polling or whatever for uh, the campaign, the last election where I call people on the phone. And you know, you have people have intentions to vote, but whether they actually make it to the polls is different. Um, and even when I talked to people on the phone, they were like, I meant to do this, but I haven't done it yet. So that's where it's, you know, where the rubber meets the road. So here's another great one, and this is the behavior change wheel. Um, and this is from the Combi model of behavior. The Combi model of behavior was developed from 19 behavioral change frameworks. And here's why this is really cool, because it says that there's three essential conditions for behavioral change. And that's capability, opportunity, and motivation. Those form the hub of the wheel. And then you can see all the elements outside that have an impact. So if you look around that, the red part are the intervention functions. So education, restrictions, modeling, all the details. There's details here. You can also, we also provide resources to give you more about COMB. Um, and then the final one are policy categories that will impact also behavior change. And then with this theory and with all theories and models, there's typically scales that you can give people. And what that means is that if you look under um, education and how education plays a role in capability, opportunity, motivation, you can give people a survey with a series of items that measure where they are in education, depending on whom they are. And then depending on who they are, that tells you where the gaps are and what you need to be successful. And that's with a lot of the theories and models. I think people sometimes say, well, I don't know what to do with these theories and models, but they have assessments and measures and guides for how you can use research to see where people are. Because what you may find is it's not a matter of education. Maybe it's surrounding modeling, that there's not enough visible role models within or people that they know that are getting the vaccination. Um, so the behavior change wheel is really helpful. All right, understand biases. I think um, Olivia is going to put in the chat a great link that shows uh, 50 cognitive bias biases to be aware of that I'm not going to cover here. Uh, but we do talk about all sorts of biases in the report and how it can impact. But I just wanted to pull out a few of these um, that uh, I think are probably relevant. The first is optimism bias, and that typically believes that your likelihood of experiencing events that are um, negative are lower than other people. So I overestimate my positivity in life. I don't think I'm gonna get affected by COVID um, because people typically have an optimism bias and all those can be affected, right? So if you live in a area that has a lot of COVID-19 and then you go to somewhere very public and you don't get it, then you're even more confident. And you're, you're like, well, I was just around so-and-so and I just don't think I'm gonna get it. So those are the optimism bias, but this happens, I mean, there's all sorts of research on not just optimism bias, but other biases that people think are better than other people at what they actually are. Um, and then there's confirmation bias. Is that where people have opinions and then they seek out information that aligns with their beliefs? There's been a lot of research, not just on vaccines, but also about um, politics and I mean, even mask wearing and other areas as well that confirmation bias has been applied. But uh, you also see this as selective exposure where exposing yourself to information that aligns with your beliefs. And then the status quo, which we call in the paper admission bias. 
And that's a really interesting bias. And what that means is that people typically have a preference for inaction, meaning I'm not going to do anything, uh, even when taking an action is more beneficial. So we call that the status quo. Now, you know what? I haven't really gotten it now. It just sounds like a lot of trouble. I think I'm okay where I am and I'm not going to go get it. Um, I'll just continue wearing my mask and these behaviors. And you know what? The risk, I think, are probably worse than the vaccine itself. And you know, I don't think that's been discussed enough as well that people weigh. Uh, and what's interesting, especially in vaccination conversations, that people outweigh you know the pain of a shot more so than the risk of of you know potentially dying or getting very ill from COVID. But that's why you know you have to be aware of cognitive biases. But you can't also um, you can't also tear people down because they have biases. So we, uh, IPR did a lot of great work. I am, of course, biased, so I call it our great work on uh, mis disinformation specifically. But one of the reasons why we put misinformation in here, to give you just a quick assessment of what the difference is, is that misinformation is false information. Disinformation is deliberately but misinformation is also out there a lot. And it's what that means is that people aren't necessarily intentionally sending uh, information that's confusing or negative, they just do. Um, so one of the things that we learned, um, oh, and, and also I would say UNESCO has termed this period to be a disinfodemic, uh, which means an overabundance information coupled with disinformation. So I just loved that description, which is why I wanted to say it. But uh, we have on our, uh, in our Behavioral Insights Research Center, and we can include a um, link to that, some of the areas of how you address misinformation. Uh, Dr. Terry Flynn from McMaster put together a great guide about combating uh, uh, misinformation. We also have information on there, not only just our regular disinformation study, but about how not to share uh, disinformation. Because what we're going to see starting to hit social media is that people sharing the I heards and look at this meme. So giving people ways for not doing it. One of the ways um, that you have to be really careful when addressing misinformation is not to repeat and share the misinformation. Because in some cases, people can remember the misinformation, even though you're trying to correct it. So you have to be very thoughtful about it. Other ways that misinformation can be um, impacted is if you have multiple people dispel the misinformation. Um, what, uh, so, but if you do, if you do correct it, it needs to be based on science, facts, and, um, but don't repeat false statements because all it does is increase uh, familiarity with those. And also don't engage with trolls. Don't engage with trolls because all it does is, you know, um, feed the trolls and make them want to share it more. So one of the other things that we encourage is inoculating people against misinformation. And this is a theory called inoculation theory. And it's sort of the same way that vaccinations work and how you inoculate people. But what it basically means is that you, um, you expose some of the fallacies and arguments prior to people hearing about them. We call that the a priori method. And we also call this pre-bunking, um, but it inoculates people um, against misinformation. One of my favorite studies, I mean, one of my favorite, look at this great IPR mug. And one of my favorite studies um, that was done was done on climate change and looking at um, inoculation theory. And what it, what it says, because you know, I just said, don't repeat misinformation. It doesn't mean you tell people what they're going to hear, right? You're, you don't want to say, you know, that vaccine has, has big side effects, and that's some of the misinformation. Instead, you tell them what people will typically give misinformation about. So you say, you may hear misinformation about the potential side effects. You may hear misinformation about X. And they did the same thing with climate change. And that's, you're prepping people for what they may hear in terms of misinformation without giving specifics as to what that misinformation may be. And what that does is it puts them on the lookout that they anticipate hearing some information and also assessing it better. And then ensuring them what are the trusted sources of information. Like there will be misinformation about the vaccine and the impact. You will hear stories, but, and then you say this. And what that also does um, when they looked at it with climate change is that it increased consistent uh, consensus around uh, climate change. 
So what they say is that potentially neutralizes some of the arguments that people make that have some sort of technique or fallacy. All right, language matters. This doesn't shock comms people, of course, but language plays a big role. And some of the language that we've heard so far can be considered problematic. And you know, it was the same thing that we saw when COVID with um, people try to correct physical distancing over social distancing, and it never worked, by the way. People still say social distance, social distance. And if you think about it, what, they, what it should have been was physical distancing. Um, but I think now they actually want people to, uh, to so physically, socially distant as well. But the, so the physical distancing is a, has a very different um, perspective, especially when you think about mental health and social distancing. But there's terms that turn people off. Anti-vaxxers is one term. Like you're not going to win any points if you say anti-vaxxers. So that's why we, and it's interesting, I reached out to one of my trustees at healthcare and I was like, what do you call people? And he's like, I don't know. We don't have like consistent language. So I just termed it the anti-vaccination movement. Even that would probably, that's probably not the best term. Um, but I know that vaccine risk aware isn't the right term as well. But there's, but conspiracy theories, calling people's theories, a con this is a conspiracy theory, that also turns them off. There's, you know, saying that like something's not true versus this conspiracy theory, when even if it is a conspiracy theory, it doesn't win any points. You know, people aren't going to say, oh, that's interesting. Yes, I guess I am a conspirator, right? Uh, conspirator, conspirator. Um, but uh, so you have to be careful about that. One of the other ones that we're also using quite a bit is Operation Warped Speed. And what they've seen is that using the term Operation Warped Speed, they've done is that people are considered about the rushed process. And why they're considered, they're concerned about the rush process is because they don't know the process that the vaccine had to go through. Um, and, you know, they talk about, you know, here's the approval process, but calling it Warped Speed or a rushed vaccine it doubts, it puts into doubt some of the, the uh, efficacy and potential safety of the vaccine, especially when there's no, when they say on average, a vaccine takes four years, but this only took this many months. And it makes people say, oh my gosh, are they concerned? Are they, and then you add in all the other trust issues and potential other issues that people thought from, you know, historic systemic um, perceptions of healthcare or their communities and how that plays a role. Also, public health agencies is better than saying the federal government um, because public health agencies are part of the government. But you know, people also have a bias against even the term government, even though um, you know a lot of different aspects are part of the government. I mean, libraries and schools. So uh, you just have to think about, just think very carefully about the terms that are used because language motivates action, and powerful language can have an impact. I'll give you another example that I found online that I thought was interesting. And uh, somebody, I apologize, I didn't get their name, um, but one of the reporters talk about that this pandemic has really used the language of war. And they said, you know, talking about the people who succumb to COVID-19 as the weak and those who recover are strong. And, you know, and uh, case in point after President Trump recovered from COVID, he said, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. You're going to beat it. And if you think about from a control perspective, what that tells is number one, that you know if you're strong, you can beat it. But number two, that you have some element of control of, of um, determining your outcome from COVID. And that's not necessarily the case, right? So you have to be really careful about how you, how you talk, how you speak, because it can have an impact on overall um, uptake and acceptance. So we have just a couple more here. Um, and these are not as long as the others. And I see we have some questions. Like I said, I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'll read the questions, but I, I can't see the chat or questions as I'm sharing the screen. Um, but one of the, I know this sounds silly, like of course you would listen. Why wouldn't you listen? We listen all the time. Um, but uh, Dr. Jim McNamara, who's a University of Technology in Sydney, um, he's done extensive research on what we call listening architecture in organizations and found that organizations, that many organizations who say they listen, don't actually have an arch architecture or a mechanism set up to actually listen to employees. But listen to people's concerns about the vaccine. Don't brush them off. Don't brush them off as conspiracy theories. Really hear what they're trying to say. Any rumors that go around also can identify issues, but it also gives you armor to think about, all right, 
here's what we're hearing. We're hearing consistent one-offs or consistent information about um, uh, vaccines. So here's what we need to do to sort of pre-bump those. All right, and the last thing is technology can help increase uptake. Not surprising, but uh, the research shows that digital push technologies such as text messaging have been effective at increasing um, uptake, including for a series of vaccination, including for that second reminder. And you know, this is where organizations can really help. Um, also gamification or playing games can also help with education. I haven't, there may be, I apologize, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen much gamification around the vaccination. And then don't forget, of course, to track your, uh, your um, measurement efforts. But I wanted to show you, I wanted to show you this. Um, this is an example of, if you can see, it is kind of small on the left. Uh, it's really big on my very big monitor. Um, but if you look on the uh, left, this is the COVID-19 vaccination um, record card. And this is probably very similar to the, uh, a card that was given to my parents in the seven, mid 70s when I was born. Um, but this to me is, you know, this is a special card to hold your doses and record your doses. And what's interesting to me is that we haven't really adopted blockchain, which is like a permanent record that you can access that shows the vaccination. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's still this, uh, this, I mean, people aren't going to carry it around. You'd have to take a picture of it, which they're encouraging people to do, take a picture of it and keep it. But um, I'll tell you that pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens do have extensive tracking systems where to set up appointments, notify people when second shots are required. But it's really important to help facilitate this and make sure that there is some sort of tech reminders or ways that you can help facilitate your employees. I'm sorry, my dog is kicking off. But a way to facilitate employees getting that second shot or getting vaccinated and help identify the barrier so they can do it. Um, because the, I, this is actually quoted in my piece, the warp speeds chief advisor, there's that warp speed, that for Americans who get the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, I know we're still waiting on the uh, Moderna unless something happened while I was uh, doing this, but they have to come back three or four weeks later to get that second vaccine dose to complete the immunization schedule. So um, one of the, uh, 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 there's, there's a description of the dosage tracking element so far as draconian as far as tracking the virus. And if you look on the far right side, this is uh, this was by a um, uh, hospital in Norway, and it's not COVID, but it's fight HPV. And what it was, it was a gamification way that you can learn more about HPV. And you, there's achievements and leaderboards and way to engage people and give the information. So having like a one-stop shop where people would know about, be able to make appointments, learn about the vaccination, what they need to know, set the reminders, but also engage them in education and, you know, tying in this whole um, COVID to behaviors that you already do, saying that vaccinations are essential as washing your hands, wearing masks, physical distancing also plays a role. So the last thing I want to tell you, and I know that, gosh, this is, think about what students go through, this nice uh, lecture for uh, you know, almost 15 minutes, but uh, IPR, I shout out to the IPR team who've just been just kicking you know what, uh, the, the past uh, few weeks as we uh, wrap in. They worked and put together an IPR COVID-19 Vaccine Resource Center that has a lot of the studies we talked about. Um, it has this guide we talked about, but it also gives you uh, more insight into the research that we talked about in some of the articles that uh, everything I said today wasn't like the world of Tina. It was really backed by the research that we found and the research that we did with 100 plus articles. But you can go in here, feel free to, I'll get to the questions, but you know, feel free to, um, uh, I'm more than happy to carry on this conversation. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Twitter, Tina Corkendale, so happy to do so. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and this can all be accessed at the Institute for PR website. We have running banners uh, that show that. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen to see the sort of questions that people have. Um, so I'm happy to answer. Um, oh, wow, okay, these are some great questions. Uh, let's see, uh, there's one that says, do you have any other strategies outside of inoculation theory to counter disinformation online and offline? Yes, there is a lot 
there is a lot of information that we do have on our website that talks about how to counter disinformation. Um, and so disinformation being deliberately misleading information, but also misinformation. And yes, so we have that in addition to inoculation theory, also understand certain biases. Um, and uh, there's a great guide that uh, we can put in there that's from Burke that also tells you 10 ways to counter uh, misinformation as well. Um, our pharmacists is on par with doctors and nurses as trusted source. Oh, let me read this. I'm reading this to myself, but I should be reading out to all of you as well. Our pharmacists is on par with doctors and nurses as trusted sources, especially since CVS and Walgreens are involved in the distribution. I'm not really sure. I believe the nurses and doctors are more frontline because they're the ones that people go to and they're the ones who can encourage. I do think though, that when people have other, have other, um, when they go to their pharmacy, that they should encourage people when it has a wider road out, rollout to do the vaccination and how important it is. And I think there are uh, touch points out there as pharmacists, especially because they're the ones who, who understand. And you know, it'll be a point where we go to um, the uh, pharmacies that, you know, CVS and Walgreens when we get our vaccinations. So absolutely. Okay, hold on. All right, thanks for the kudos, Carrie. Appreciate that. Can you share some best practices in health literacy on your website? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of it is part of it is um, the HRSA that we mentioned, and we have a link to it. They do have some health literacy resources on their site, um, and there's a that would be a really great thing to share uh, with employees to take like a health literacy class to help understand. So they do facilitate that. It's not something IPR does, but we do have uh, information resources about health communications. You can go to research in the research library and be able to do that. Um, hold on, I'm still going through questions. Yeah, so Patty, this is a good question. Was there any discussion in the report about how companies who choose to require the vaccine can best communicate that? You know, there isn't go into much detail. It's a great follow-up that we could do um, and talk to companies that are requiring it because it is really sensitive. And then, you know, to what extent do you require it? Require it if somebody has a religious, um, you know, their religious objection, which they can opt out. So how do you manage that? Um, I, I think it's really, and even just conversations I've had with some of the CCOs saying, oh no, we absolutely would never require something like that. Um, but for, you know, smaller organizations, even like my own team is, um, you know, can you, I, when you get back in person, like absolutely people need to be vaccinated. Um, but I haven't seen that. Um, uh, but if anyone else has seen it, um, but when we do, Patty, we'll definitely share that out because that's a really, really, really a good point. Maybe we can get some of our trustees uh, to give us their insight as well. Um, yeah, so there we will have a recording of the Zoom so you can get that. Oh, so Carrie said, is there any evidence you can point to on the use of humor messaging? There are a few studies out there that do have, um, that do have talking about humor and vaccination. Uh, so we're, that's a, that's a, it's interesting. We didn't include anything here, um, but there's, I think not even just humor as long as it's not um, insulting or put downs, but also just keeping animations to show and those uh, can be very effective. They've shown that in other sort of health uh, behaviors as well is that humor can help. You just want to, it's, it's definitely a, um, a, uh, um, you know, a slope that you can go down. Now, what's uh, what uh, Peppercom, uh, Steve Cody is our chair of the board for the next uh, 13 more days, but they they require uh, training, like comedic training of all their, um, their employees. And part of that is trying to read the room and see if it's appropriate for whatever you're trying to do. All right, um, let me see. There's more questions coming in. Um, Okay, what tactics are others using to get information on where their employees fall on the scale of vaccine acceptance? Oh, well, so I'm sure they want other people to ask that and want to see, well, what are people doing to encourage vaccine, vaccine acceptance among employees? What, uh, what I and like really do an in-depth and, you know, people may say, well, that's HIPAA, but understanding how they think about vaccinations, understanding where people fall on the scale, what their worries are, uh, um, 
Harris Poll, Leger out of Canada. Um, there are Morning Consul. They're doing some great research that sort of gives a pulse on what people, Americans are feeling in general, um, and even on the global scale. Um, one of the reports I didn't talk about here, but we country survey that looked specifically at vaccine hesitancy and see where employee or where people think in different countries and what are the big encourage you um, to go to that. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so understand it's best for agencies to be aligned, but what if they're not? Many hospitals do their own thing. And that's exactly A, um, are an important line of or an important source, uh, but they do work a lot with the uh, area. Um, so as much as the, and that's why you have to have a, a group together that can uh, talk about the issues and it has to be aligned as much as it can be. And working with these external partners and external sources uh, within, the, um, within the area or region where what is the messaging and what can we have as the key messages that are consistent? And you'll have, you know, other cases, especially possibly by other officials where they're not aligned with messaging and they are spreading misinformation. So making sure you stick to that point, being a trusted source for the community and providing accurate information and being transparent, that's where that comes into play. Um, okay. Oh, there's some questions in the chat. Okay. Oh, wait. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> so what I did say, uh, William Healy said that all this is Kanye West, Katy Perry, and Justin Bieber. I do. I appreciate that. That's really great. Um, so uh, Pat Ford. Hi, Pat. I just spent an hour and a half with him earlier today. Uh, given the extraordinary needs for social media and other stakeholder engagement, consumer education events, and content development, do you have advice for how students and young pros conceive opportunities for getting involved in the communications needed? Absolutely. I think is um, I think as this goes on, what we're going to find is that the young um, the young adults are going to be unless there's health issues or they work in healthcare or frontline, they're going to be one of the last vaccinated. When we get to the point where they're going to be vaccinated, we may be at that vaccine coverage area where they say we have herd immunity because the vaccine is 90 to 95% effective, which means you don't need, you're at, I, and this, please don't quote me on this, but like 60% people have to be vaccinated. So when you get to the end, and even we've seen, you know, in critical, and those peer groups the young PR professionals serving as leaders, being visibly vaccinated and saying how important it is. I think the young PR professionals, ones who are in the young uh, group in PRSA is a good example and the others, they can absolutely do a campaign to encourage others to get, uh, to get others uh, vaccinated in their peer group, because I think this is gonna be difficult, especially with others. Um, Darren Fitzgerald, thanks for, uh, Thanks for um, sharing what you did. Um, I do have to, uh, um, someone asked, was the level of efficacy of the vaccine inoculation against COVID-19? I, I don't, I'm not a healthcare person. I can just tell you what I saw on the media. So you probably want to go to the Pfizer and the Moderna site. But uh, from what I understand, don't repeat this, it's about 90 to 95%. Um, okay, so the small but very visible minority of peers who are against vaccination, uh, Dan Nguyen asked how we can do that. And then, then I have to wrap up or um, everyone's going to, uh, my people are going to um, uh, cut me off. Uh, well, so I think one here, one is against, and you will have the, you will have the individuals who will say like, absolutely not, I will not get vaccinated. I'd rather leave. And that may happen, but it's also worth listening to them and maybe getting a group of individuals together who are absolutely anti-vax and listen to what they have to say and working with them. Um, but if you have, if you have, you know, a small group and you're not requiring it, you know, you may want to spend your efforts, but you also want to see how is that impacting the others and what is the impact they're having and do they have a voice? 
um, but definitely listen. This is where listening comes in. I wish we had more time. I, I'm very passionate, obviously you can see, very passionate about this topic. And I know my, uh, the team at IPR is too, but I hope you found this helpful. You can go to the report, uh, download the center. I think Sarah, the amazing uh, Sarah Jackson, thanks uh, for the team for all their work on this. She's going to um, close it out. Feel free to connect with me and I hope you all have a great holiday. So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tina. So this marks the end of our webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. The playback will be made available on our website in the next couple of days. Um, going forward, IPR will be having more web vaccine related webinars in uh, our research letter to learn more about that. We're also going to have a new in a car with IPR episode featuring Nick Woodall coming in January. So thank you all for joining us today and happy holidays.